So uh, Larry is our, our final speaker of the day. Larry Keeley is co-founder and the president of, of Doblin. Again, this is, if you live in, in uh, the world of design, you certainly must know the Doblin group. Uh, Doblin is now a part of uh, Deloitte, or, I don't, or is Deloitte part of you guys now? Right? No, it's the other way around. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're uh, quite clear about that. But uh, Q, uh, uh, Larry is, is a, a director uh, at uh, Deloitte. He's also the author of a 10 Types of Innovation and the Discipline of Building Breakthroughs, and that's a book that helps leaders identify uh, new innovation op opportunities and accelerate existing ideas. Bloomberg Business Week named uh, Larry one of the seven innovation gurus that are changing the field. I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, and in 2010, they selected Larry as one of the 27 most influential designers in the world. So he's a champion of the potential impact of a strategic combination of design and business. Uh, and Larry's part of the core design faculty in the uh, Triple M program. And in 2014, uh, Northwestern Siegel Design Institute named Larry as a distinguished fellow. So I'm really delighted to have you all join us. Thank you, Walter. Walter was, of course, far too gracious to mention that when we founded Doblin 35 years ago, the other guy was actually named Doblin and knew what he was doing. <laughs> so um, here's why I love being at Northwestern. It's really simple. It's really important. In this institution, you can't swing a cat without hitting somebody that's trying to change the world and expects to. And that's true whether you're talking about the faculty or the students. And so it's a really exciting thing to talk about the role. Don't worry, it's a black slide, it's on purpose. Oh, okay. <laughs> no I'm need to panic, still... okay? Feeling better now, Walter? Okay. <laughs> Mr. So I'm going to talk to you about how we get the future to show up slightly ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival. I'm really proud to be on a panel with these distinguished colleagues and friends, people that I've known for a long time. We've had already an interesting sort of bula base of thoughts shared with you. I loved the moment when my good friend Kathleen said that design-savvy competitors are going to dominate every marketplace. And then we see in the tail end of the festivities when Jerry is showing us how she's trying to do that inside of a very difficult market condition, right? Where she's got to change the experience by doing it indirectly through a series of businesses she does not own and can only barely influence thanks to the robinson patman Act in the 1930s, right? So, um, so Jerry, I'm very empathetic about this. I was at my... Lexus dealership last week, and <laughs> I realized that I had bought nine Lexuses from the same bunch of fools that um, couldn't pick me out of a police lineup. So they hadn't quite gotten that whole recognition thing, greeting thing. None of those moments that matter seem to have uh, occurred to them. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, and I may need you to. It seems to be hopeless at the dealer I've been using, but. I'm also very fond of this moment that my friend Teague has just sort of cited. He said, look, what's going to happen is we're going to democratize design. We're going to make sure that everybody knows how to do it sometime soon. This is a really lovely echo of the original idea of disruptive innovation, which was defined as democratizing scarce expertise. So what am I going to do to add to those things instead of just you know, sort of interfering with our ability to go out and have the drinks pretty soon. I'm going to give you a sense of what it means to think about innovation as an emerging science, a discipline. What I think is silly, stupid, and a giant waste of time is to make this false dichotomy between business thinking and design thinking, okay? I'm lucky enough to teach in this great institution at Kellogg and in the DSGN and Triple M programs. I'm also lucky enough to teach at the world's number one rated graduate design school, the first school that gave out PhDs in design. We started doing that 22 years ago. Okay. And here's what is interesting to me. In both cases, the design schools think, oh my goodness, we need to be teaching 
the students more business savvy. So they throw in a couple of electives. And what we're doing in most business schools is throwing in a couple of design electives. When you stop and think about it, that's silly. What we all have to have is more time to master the expertise that's now that now matters for complicated problems. And frankly, as several of our speakers have touched on, a great deal more respect and collegiality and hunger for the ideas and expertise of those fields we didn't have time to get trained in. That's where the action is, and that's what I thought I would talk about. I'm calling this Finding the Future First, getting it to show up somewhat ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival, and I'm going to talk to you about what it means to transform the ways in which we get things to happen with more discipline, more skill, and a great deal more methodology. I think most of innovation today is about sort of identifying the very common myths and substituting method, rooting out the lore and bringing some urgently needed logic, okay? Now, this is already a big deal. There is some question at the Kellogg Graduate School of Management about whether or not this is a serious topic or not, okay? Well, in the post-Steve Jobs era, it's pretty clear that everybody's trying to figure out how to get better at innovation, and they're hungry for it, okay? The problem is that innovation turns out not to be the way we characterize it in the popular press and the movies, even in the schools, right? Remember when you were a kid, you saw a Disney movie about a flying car, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, based on a book written by, many people don't realize this, Ian Fleming, the same guy that wrote James Bond novels, right? But you remember the inventor? It was Caracatus T. Potts, the crazy inventor in the outhouse, right? This is the way we teach innovation in the popular culture. And it's not that way, right? <laughs> We've discovered after years and years of studying that it's harder than that, and it deserves to be treated with a bit more seriousness, a bit more discipline, and frankly, an awful lot more respect. Now, underlying all of that is this moment we live in, this extraordinary moment of change. How many of you think, just show of hands, that we live in the most exceptional time of change in the history of our species? Okay, that's a pretty considerable body. I would say it was roughly 70% of the, of the people in the audience. Normally, I would ask if this was an actual class and you were taking it for credit, how many of you think we aren't living in the most serious time of change? This, in order to see how many are sandbagging me, okay? <laughs> but here's the thing. Change is easy to spot when you stand in the present and look backwards in time. That we can spot. We can see it all the time, right? So when I was a kid your age, in the Pleistocene era at the University of Michigan, I owned a whole bunch of these things. Recently I had the sort of terrifying experience of one of my adult daughters handing me one and said, Dad, have you ever heard these things before? They're really warm sounding. <laughs> right? What I did, of course, is I repurchased my entire music collection when it came out in this form. That worked out really well for the music publishers of the world because I'm a spectacularly slow learner. I did the same thing all over again when it moved to this, I'm sure Apple's gearing up to sell me an MP4 file, an MP5 file, or an MP6 file, and the desperate hope I'll do that instead of streaming my music in the near future, right? This is the kind of change that's easy to spot. The kind of change that's hard to spot is what we're actually living through, exponential change, change that is happening on top of other changes, second order and third order effects of extraordinarily popular platforms. Let's see if we can't illustrate that for a moment. We've all heard about big data, humongous data, enormous data, massive data, but really these things seem like abstractions. I bet we've got a pretty astute bunch of individuals in the audience, so most of you will know the answer to a thought experiment I often use with clients. It goes like this. Let's take a time that we'll label now, right this minute, now. Okay, let's back up 
to the beginning of our species, which most anthropologists will tell you is at least 30,000 years old. If you buy into some of this crazy Chuck Darwin theory stuff, you might go back a full two million years, all the hominids, everything else, back to monkeys. I know, that's controversial. Okay. <laughs> if we also put in a vertical and we say this is data and this is 100% of the data that exists on our small blue planet right now, Here's the thought experiment. How many years do we have to go back to get just 10% of the data we have now? How many years back in time does it take to get to 10% of the data that exists this moment? Somebody shout out a guess. Three or four years. Three or four years. Other guesses? Three months. Four hours, Three months. Four hours ago. <laughs> There are some people in the room that are getting exponentials. I love that. You know, some people, when I ask this question, they say, well, what time is it right now? <laughs> okay, so we got a pretty interesting range, but you guys are very savvy. The longest range I got was four years. The actual answer for this moment is two years. That's draw not drawn to scale. Very hard to draw that to scale, by the way. <laughs> two years ago, we had 10% of the data we have now. Just kind of let that wash over you for a moment. Ask yourself what consequence does it have? What is that going to mean for creating the future and getting it to show up somewhat ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival? What does that mean for a world where savvy competitors are going to be design-led and where individuals are going to learn how to have more access to the power of design and the ability to change the world than ever before and where we're actually supposed to know a customer when they show up? I mean, that's a crazy idea, Jerry, you realize, right? <laughs> so what do we do with all that? Here's something really useful. This is a concise list of the bedrock skills of designers. This is the special magic that they bring to the capabilities that they have. I could give you a similar list for engineers. How many of you are getting trained in engineering and are already trained and are card-carrying engineers? Well, look around. Put your hands up. Be proud, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> all right, here's the deal with engineers. Why are they important in the world? Because you can't get one of those degrees unless you can make shit that works, okay? <laughs> that's super valuable. This is what designers do that's valuable. And when you scan this list of qualities, think about how important it is in a time of extraordinary change. And think about how different these individuals are from the ones that just sort of passively accept whatever device came out of a fancy pants, well-packaged box, and say, well, okay. I'll use it, all right? These are the people that make stuff, make it different, make it compelling, make it vivid in a time of extraordinary change, okay? Now, in our practical lives, those of us who are experiencing this world of change experience it this way. We get little pieces of magic all around us, right? How many of you use Uber, just so I can calibrate? Give me a shout out. What do you like about Uber? Price points. Price points. Cheaper than taxis. What else? Convenient. Convenient. What else? No hefting. No use money. And what did you say, sir? Yeah, exactly. It's so, it's, uh, all the magic happens in the device you already have in your pocket, right? All kinds of things going on here. Now, stop and look at it from a different lens. What's truly new about Uber? Nothing, nothing. Here's a critically important principle to know and tell about modern 21st century innovation. It's less and less about primary invention. I know this comes as a troubling fact to some of you. And much, much more about the elegant integration of things that are well known. And indeed, many things that have been around for decades. Stitching it together, making it cool, making it memorable, standing out. Design-savvy competitors will dominate every marketplace, my colleague tells us. Okay. Here's how we experience that in the appification of the world. Remember the old ad that said, there's an app for that. There really is. There's a million apps in iOS, a million apps plus in iTunes Music Store. Okay. Nobody needs a million apps. You, they'd be exhausting, right? You don't even a fraction of those. But what the magic is, is that we select the ones we want. 
we integrate them as they reply to our lives and then somehow or other, under the covers, they magically manage themselves, right? We don't have to understand it anymore. You don't have to go to your tech guy and say, make it work. Every day it updates itself. It gets a little bit smarter, a little bit better, and it does it all without you having to know anything, do anything, or particularly participate. You just have to sit it near some Wi-Fi at trust. And magic stuff happens. It's a really interesting thing. Other weird shit is happening. <laughs> How many of you played ever World of Warcraft in your lifetimes? Put your hands up. Be proud. Okay. For those of you that haven't caught this, Joey Ito, the guy who currently runs the MIT Media Lab, was a level four warlord of World of Warcraft. He was commanding 25,000 young people in battle. He says, to this day, it's the hardest thing he ever did or ever will do in his life. Seems trivial, but at any given moment, there are six to 11 million people playing World of Warcraft, mostly adolescent males. This is the game that never sleeps. And why that's interesting is because these young people, possibly a teenager in your own household, have figured out how to mimic and even in many cases exceed the very best human pr resources practices of the world's best companies. Don't believe me? You can't survive in World of Warcraft without being in a guild. The average guild has more than 21 people. To attract the best players, you do things like creating logos. What I've sneezed onto the screen here are a variety of the logos created by the players themselves in ways never anticipated by the game designers, Blizzard Entertainment, in order to attract the world's best talent. Players are rated for their strategy skills, their tactical skills, their courage in battle, their intestinal fortitude, and they are very aggressively sought by the very best guilds. Somebody in the guild has to have a particularly, you know, kind of tech-savvy parent. Generous, too. Because you have to have a super high-performance setup in your living room in order to do well in this game, including maybe the Apple Cinema display. That's the one so big it deserves its own postal code, right? But catch this, in the global ecosystem of World of Warcraft, there are 20,000 advances in the state of play each and every day. 20,000 advances in this gaming system per day. Imagine a world where we get 20,000 advances every day in how to deal with diabetes and how to optimize financial services and systems in a time when we've got systemic risk or how to, dare I dream, give Congress some clue <laughs> about how to not damage too severely the country they theoretically are running. Wouldn't that be interesting? That's a sensing learning network, a system of epic sophistication. And it's happening. Let me illustrate. A couple of years ago, the Game designers in World of Warcraft decided that it was getting a little imbalanced. The guilds were getting so good, the monsters were getting whacked all the time. <laughs> so they decided to create some fancy new features for the monsters. Okay, now this actually gets a little sensitive, and I want to be careful. And I, I really appreciated specifically the way Kathleen treated her sort of work with Ebola in Western Africa, okay, Guinea and and the other places that are so severely hit. But the idea for these monsters a couple years ago was literally based on Ebola before there were lots of really scary breakouts in the world. They decided to give the monsters a feature that they named Corrupted Blood. Here's how that would work. If you're a player in World of Warcraft and you whack that monster with your broadsword or you tag it with your RPG and you get sprayed with the blood, 45 minutes of game playing time later, you would bleed out and you would die. What fun. Okay. Some of you are thinking, this is great. All those teenagers not doing their homework are going to have to go back to, you know, studying for a little while. But it was weirder than that. The programmers at Blizzard Entertainment screwed up. They didn't flip the bit to keep the corrupted blood from being transmitted back to the members of your guild. 
And in the first afternoon, when they introduced this fun new feature of the game, they wiped out 337 countries in World of Warcraft. Now here's why I find that interesting, because ever since the world's best epidemiologists and infectious disease control specialists have been taking apart every single nanosecond of gameplay after that event occurred in order to determine when and how human beings learn to have positive, smart, strategic responses to break out epidemics instead of dangerous responses. Our instinct when our friends are hurt is to rush to them. Bad idea in Sierra Leone, in Guinea. How do we learn about these things in silico instead of having to learn about them on the front lines with avian flu? SARS and Ebola? That's one of the questions being asked in this unusual way. The gamification of the world is actually interesting too for other reasons. How many of you have ever played Candy Crush? Go ahead, you can admit it. <laughs> All right. Candy Crush is evil incarnate. <laughs> Candy Crush illustrates one of the things that are happening now with innovation being done with hyper-sophistication and an extraordinary amount of design research, research and, and, and sophistication. Let me illustrate. This game was the first one ever to be number one simultaneously on iOS, Android, and Facebook. Okay? It has just completely dominated the gaming world of our smartphones and devices. For those of you that have never played Candy Crush, let me give you the full fruity flavor of what this is like, okay? <laughs> there are levels, you know, surprise, surprise. It's free, surprise, surprise, until you get to a level that you can't quite finish, because then there's your opportunity for in-game purchasing, right? Here's how that works. Every single level is designed to have some challenges. The challenges are beautifully designed. They're beguiling. They're interesting. You see all kinds of stuff happening, animations, candies being crushed, and it's exciting. And they've carefully figured out about how many different moves it's going to take for you to defeat that level. And they've given you about 2 or 3% fewer moves than that to be able to finish it. If you're very good, you'll finish it and it'll all be fine. If you're not good enough, you're gonna get very, very, very close right to the edge. You smell it, you see it, that last candy, you're ready to crush it, and you're out of moves. Now you can do that five times, and then the game punishes you by not allowing you to play for two hours. <laughs> or, or, you could pay 80 cents and keep playing. I was telling this story to an audience a while ago, and a woman in the audience says, no, you can change your clock setting. <laughs> I said, madam, is it possible you've played Candy Crush a little too much? So here's the thing. You get really close to that level finishing, and oh, I'm out of moves. But wait. 80 cents, that's all I got to do. Well, 151 billion individual players, I'm sorry, games were played in the first year after it was launched. As I said, it's the first game ever to be number one simultaneously on the three biggest global platforms. 143 million people play it every day. Those users are up 300% since the first quarter of 2013 and the monthly active users are up to 481 million, fully 30% of whom self-declare that they're addicted. This is their language, not mine, okay? And the question is how many of those people get to that level and go ahead and spend the 80 cents? Well, it turns out to be quite a lot. A million bucks a day. I know, this is deeply offensive to those of us... <laughs> that have some thin hope for, you know, advancing humanity at some point. <laughs> Anybody in the room ever played Angry Birds? You want to know why those birds are so pissed off? <laughs> They're number two in in-game sales, <laughs> and they get 11,000 bucks a day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a critically important principle of modern innovation effectiveness, all right? It happens at two levels. Down here, people hoping vaguely to be creative. 
Up here, people treating it like a pirate ship. <laughs> ready to sail into the safe harbor of their competitors under cover of foggy darkness, wait for the first light of dawn and wage war from that position. Okay? So you want to ask the question, as Walter is having us ask tonight, is innovation strategic or not? Uh -huh, yeah. Does design play a role? You betcha. Okay? And the question is, can we figure out how to use it for things that are interesting, useful, and good? Industries are going through this. I want to give you a couple of little examples. I want to pay attention to the edge of innovation today. Pay attention to how billionaires are spending their personal money on their hobbies. Because it's showing you how the future is going to show up in the next few years. If you want to be in the America's Cup yacht race, well, bring your checkbook, okay? This was AC31 just a few years ago. This class of yacht, basically a starter yacht that has a fighting chance of placing in the competition was about a $64 million investment. What I did for you for the engineers in the room, my friends, the people that can make stuff that works, as I sneezed onto the screen, some of the small number of 400 plus technologies that are imperative if you want to have a chance of winning this class of yacht race, right? You don't have that special paint, eye-wateringly expensive, that actively aligns the water molecules while you're slicing your way through the Pacific. You have zero chance of winning. Your coefficient of friction is simply too high. But something amazing happened when we got to AC32. The entire architecture of the boats changed. The boats changed to this style. This is one of the boats, one of the two finalists from AC33, just last year. This is a boat so complicated, so freaky weird, that the world's best sailors don't have a clue how to sail it. Do you remember the very sad day? last September when one of the world's best sailors died trying to figure out how to pilot one of these vessels. This is a vessel so sophisticated that it has airfoils working in two directions. The airfoil going in this direction gives you lift. It lifts so much of the boat out of the water, doesn't matter what freaking paint you have on the hull anymore. Okay? It's flying. And the airfoil in this direction gives you thrust. These are boats that move at five times the speed of the wind pushing them. Now, I paid kind of a lot of attention, I thought, in physics class, and I, I don't get that at all. Okay? That's, just, <laughs> that's just a head scratcher. It's a really amazing accomplishment. And what I think is sort of terrific about this, as we understand it, is that the best sailors in the world had to radically alter everything that they did. Oh, the price tag went up a little bit too. 404 million for this one. And this is the New Zealand craft. That in AC 33 and the last part of the regatta, best of 15 matches won six of the first seven. Remember I told you pay attention to how billionaires are spending their personal money on their hobbies? This is what their competitor was doing. Larry Ellison's little boat, 480 million. Both of those boats have such supercomputer horsepower on it that you can no longer manage it by just standing there and watching the boat and figuring out how to optimize it. Two to 3,000 data points being updated continuously every second. After losing six of the first seven in a best of 15 match, the Oracle team, Team USA, spent all night analyzing every nanosecond of every one of the matches that they lost, made two adjustments. One in software that would give the helmsman slightly better till tiller feel and one in an aileron that gave them slightly better lift out of the water. And they went on to win the next seven matches in a row. Biggest turnaround in the history of sports. What if every industry that we're all learning about at Kellogg, 
that we're all studying in McCormick, that we're all trying to advance, whether they're being advanced by the professionals on the stage behind me or the people in the, in the classes that are trying to figure out how to get themselves geared up to radically change a part of the world? What if we have to change them so much and so fast that the people that are the best for folks in the world at each of those industries can no longer figure out how to do their work? Because that may be the condition we're in, in a time of geometric change. Now this is depressing and scary at some level, but it doesn't need to be. Let me give you a little peek at the way in which I think it's going to work. How many of you have heard of second spectrum so I can calibrate? Almost nobody in the room, okay? Here's second spectrum. 25 kids in LA who do love nothing as much as winning sabermetrics competitions at the MIT's annual sabermetrics convention, okay? And this is an example of their real-time capability that radically alters how we teach and coach professional basketball. Okay? So what's going on here is they're taking apart a real-time moment in a basketball game for the LA Clippers. The guy who has the ball right now could shoot a two-point shot to that, to that rim and has, on the basis of massive amounts of data that's carefully modeled by Second Spectrum, a 45% chance of making it on the basis of his own history. But he's got other options that he could do when he's playing offense. You see them all highlighted here. He could do a short pass to his left to this player who from this position has only a 30% probability of making a three-point shot. He could throw over three defenders to this player who has a 35% chance of making a three-point shot, or a tight shot pass to his right to a player that has a very good history of shooting from that position, a 65% chance of making a three-point shot over one defender, best choice highlighted in green. Now the thing that's sort of amazing is this is done in real time. This is like magic. This is a really impressive capability, and you don't have to be even slightly interested in sports to see how this is showing us what happens as we learn to combine design and strategy and the best performance human beings hope to achieve and the best moments of their lives all in the same moment. Here's another example so you can get themes and variations. In this case, they're teaching defense. This defensive player, Bosch, standing where he's standing, Playing against some players from the Miami Heat has only a 2% chance of rebounding the ball. If he moves to any of these bright green things here, he's going to improve his odds of getting the rebound by up to 88%. Now, he doesn't need to understand anything. It's all visceral. It's all in the moment. Just watch this, and the machine says, whoa, dude, if you move over here, you're going to be a massively better player. Now, what's going on under the covers is these guys have massive data collections, not just big data, massive. They've got an ability to do real-time visualization. Did you notice that those shots, everything that doesn't matter is grayed back? Your eye goes immediately to the bright spots. That is data visualization in action, okay? They also are doing very important close examination of the details. And they're laying on top of that critical principles about which decisions of all the decisions you could make right now are the best in order to create storytelling. Now, the team of 25 eggheads in this firm in LA has a five-year plan. I mean, who doesn't? But one thing that happened last November, you all caught it in the news. Steve Ballmer, remember him? Left his job, well-paid, decided he wanted to sort of Play with his hobby. What did he do? Somebody shout it out. Bought the LA Clippers. Two billion in cash. Four times the price anybody had paid for a professional NBA team before that. And he showed up and said, what are you guys up to? And said, oh, we're just radically altering how people might play or coach or watch sports. He says, well, what's your plan? They say, well, over five years we plan to develop all these things. He says, no, you don't. You don't have a five-year plan. You got a one-year plan. Do it all for the Clippers this year. What happens when billionaires spend their personal money on their hobbies? 
we get a very accelerated way to get innovation to occur. And remember what I said before, innovation is happening in an amateurish fashion. Oh, let's stand in a room and be creative and brainstorm. Or, or it's happening with extraordinary discipline, with extraordinary skill and capabilities. Here's the thing. There have been only five times in history that have been changing as much as this one is. One of those was when human beings left the Stone Age and learned to create tools and craft things with ore and metals. It'll seem obvious after I say it, and maybe a bit trite, but here's the thing. We didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We learned to pay attention to what was different in the world and to innovate into it, okay? And that's why the times we live in feel weird. There's this new granularity of change, the apification of the world. There's this new cadence of change. It's happening faster than ever before. There's a new kind of vector of change. Young people, game players, the people that Teague is talking about putting modern lightweight innovation tools in front of, right? so that there's no resource constraints. We can all get the Kickstarter generation to do this. There's industries that have high friction of change. Congress, anybody? And industries that have low frictions of change, like IT. Oh, by the way, education, one of the most high friction industries in the world. Colossally and curious. Hasn't had a major idea since Erasmus 600 years ago. But let's leave that out there to quiver, OK? And what's really interesting is to learn how to create new levels of integration and, frankly, to orchestrate the biggest shifts away from individual products or platforms to ecosystems. That's what we're seeing in industry after industry. What individual firms achieve depends on what they have the appetite to take seriously. And what we teach in the Triple M program, I'm very proud of the program that Greg and the Dean have put together and Bruce has started to develop in a very deep way. What we teach in that class, in those courses, in that program, is that if you install the right kinds of methods, tools, and systems, you're going to get very different outcomes. At a minimum, what good organizations should do is have signature tradecraft and deep diagnostics. What you can do that's better than that is begin to have some sense of how the world is changing, what themes are mattering, and what you can be doing to create the best platforms in your industry. To do what Teague taught us about, to lightweight your innovation by using crowds and clouds and partners and prizes, and to figure out how the ecosystem is changing, as it is very dramatically in the automotive industry. Want to get even better than that? Well, for goodness sake, start to create incentives, metrics, and rewards making innovation absolutely a requirement in large-scale or medium-scale enterprises, not optional. Use tools and levers to make sure the senior executives sponsor the innovation, train high-potential young people to be the authors of innovation, and create all kinds of systems to get it to hang together. When you don't do any of this, by the way, fewer than 5% of innovations return the cost of capital. That's the global norm across 55 industries and five different continents. Put that stuff in at the bottom, the minimum hit rate you should get is a 35% success rate. 35% of your initiatives should return the cost of capital. Take a look at that, folks. That's a 7x lift over doing nothing. That's the evidence that we live in a special moment, a time when innovation and design are giving up their secrets a time when we can turn it into something that's robust and scalable. Add the stuff in the middle, you get a 50% success rate. That's a 10x lift over global norms. Plug in the stuff at the top, as we've learned to do, at 43 multi-billion dollar companies, and you can get success rates around 70%. With laboratory conditions, we've gotten them up to 82%. This is a very far cry from the time in which innovation rarely succeeded and was mostly about lightning striking, and it rarely struck twice in the same organization, okay? It's a really exciting time, ladies and gentlemen. It's a time of extraordinary change. What we owe to everybody that attends school here is to give them a peek at those sciences. What we also want to do is to expect greatness.
57 years ago, George Bernard Shaw wrote something that I've always loved, a little phrase. He said, you know, God may have made this world, but that's no excuse for us not to make it better. When you live in the greatest time of change in the history of the world, don't you think we owe that to each other? Isn't that really what serious organizations should be doing? And wouldn't we like to see it applied to something more important than freaking Candy Crush, okay? <laughs> You're welcome to the notes, to the slides. You get them here. And it was a real privilege, Walter, to be here with the little party you threw. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.